Welcome back to Forming a Franchise. My name is Rick Porter and today we're talking about marketing for your franchise. Today we're going to be joined by Marcos Mora. He's the Franchise Development Manager for Amada Franchise Systems. I actually met Marcos in, let's see, Miami, Florida uh, in late 2019. He actually did a seminar all about LinkedIn in-mail advertising, talking about identifying who your ideal customer is, uh, and I was actually blown away. And it's it's not very often that I'm blown away by people. As a matter of fact, most of the time, I think people aren't very good at what they do. Uh, Marcos is very good at what he does. So we invited him on today. I think you will learn a lot from him. I know I will certainly learn a lot from him when it comes to marketing for your franchise. Marcos, what's going on? Hey, man, how are you? Not too bad. What are you at, a standing desk over there? I'm at a standing desk. You're getting your exercise, huh? Like I, I have a chair, but it's kind of like when people come in to talk, but like, like I don't, I never, I don't sit anymore. That's not a chair. That's a coat rack to your right, <laughs> or your yeah, left. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, like I just, it's just like where I put my crap in there, you know. So yeah. If if we can, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us about you, and uh, and then we can dive into it. Yeah, you bet. Uh, Marcus Mora, Chief Development Officer for Amada Senior Care, and one of the founders of I'm one of the founders of the of the franchise. We started franchising in 2012. Uh, and actually it was, it was accidental. I think, I think this is probably very similar to most franchises out there. We were, we were one of the largest home care companies here in Orange County. And, uh, a friend of ours, Robert Christensen called and he's like, Hey, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, uh, I'm getting the, the boot from Pfizer. He'd been at Pfizer for 13 years and he actually was super excited. He's like, I'm so excited. I'm getting fired. Cause he, he kept lasting through all of his, uh, uh, all of the, the, uh, uh layoffs. And he finally was like, I'm getting laid off and I'm getting my severance, right? Which is, which was over a hundred grand. And he's like, I'm going to become the first franchise of Amada Senior Care. And our answer to him was actually, well, we don't franchise. Well, Rob, we'll help you, you know, investigate visiting angels or right at home or open one of those. Like we're, we're not interested. And, and Rob did a little bit and he'd come back. He's like, guys, I don't, I want to be an Amada franchisee. So, uh, he came out and he flew out. He's like in our office grabbing pamphlets and uh, uh, my business partner, Toph, was like, what's this guy doing in here? We don't franchise. Get him out of here. He's going to steal our information. He was actually mad. And so Rob became our first franchisee. He just like he was so insistent. And I think if if Rob had not been there, we never would have franchised. Really, I don't I don't think this we would be here today if if Rob didn't exist. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's how we started uh, uh, franchising back in 2012. We now have 120 or so locations throughout the country. And uh, we're not, you know, we're not one of those explosive franchises. We grow by 20 to 30 franchises a year, uh, and we're super happy with that. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me and Ahmad and our background. No kidding. And now you are the franchise development manager over there, and and yeah, obviously from the look on the screen, you're doing a ton of marketing and and podcasts and things like that. One of the things that, that yeah. I wanted to start with is. You know, you're selling 20 or 30 of these. Obviously, things are working for you. What are you seeing on the franchise marketing side that's working well? So, okay, then when you talk about franchise marketing, you're talking about the our the ability to to find entrepreneurs that are right for your business, right? You got it. So, listen, I think I think the 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 main thing about this is there's sort of this I think misconception with franchising that so many people think that they they build a model, right? So, let's say you, your model is fitness or it's food or it's uh, cinch IT, you know, desktop support uh, or home care that you built a model that that kind of anybody can do, right? That anybody can come in and run that. So you think that, OK, so I have a fitness concept and I can bring on a uh, retired stay at home mom uh, whose kids are now in college and she wants to get into business. She can run a fitness industry or a fitness concept or I can bring uh, an executive from IBM where she's been there for 30 years and, and she now wants to start a business like people from all walks of life. And I don't actually believe that. I think, I think that the, the, the issue is, is, is we spend so much time trying to find the right audience for our product. Like if you're, if you're fitness 
and you're looking for people over the age of 50 to be your client or, you know, uh, I don't know who your audience is for, for like, for example, what, who's your ideal audience for Cinch IT? Is it anyone and everyone that needs desktop support or do you have like a specific client you're trying to to help out? We have a very specific client. So we'll work with a couple of verticals, but on the consumer side, when we're looking for uh, the ideal candidate, the ideally it's actually, and I'm not saying this just because you're on here, we're working yeah. for the, we're looking for that home healthcare agency who's heavily right. regulated, who is worried about compliance and dealing with all the HIPAA laws. And they're looking for a company that can guide them, protect them and give them the cybersecurity they need. Yeah. So like that rolls off your tongue, right? You like, here's exactly what I'm looking for. And I think any brand out there that has been successful, they've done the same thing. Like they have a very specific audience that they want to go after with their product. But then when they start franchising, all of a sudden that goes out the window. They're, they're like, oh, who do you want to sell a franchise to? The first answer is anybody who's got the money to pay me the franchise fee. That's number one, right? They got the money, sell them a franchise, right? And then sometimes you get folks that say, I really want to sell a franchise to somebody who was an executive in corporate America. Okay, but that that doesn't define anybody. I mean, there's executives in film or marketing or IT or, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing or trucking industry, and they're all different kinds of people. And so it's really it's always been really, really strange to me that in the franchise industry, we lose this like here's exactly who i want to find so i think what's your question was what's working i'll tell you the, the only thing i think that works is you need to really identify who is the audience that you want to award your franchise to um because because no your business is not good enough your system is not good enough to be run by anybody nothing is um to think that your restaurant or your retail store or your service franchise or your food franchise or your fitness, whatever the heck you have can be run by anybody is crazy. And yet I think that's what a lot of franchisors do today. I agree. Actually, in the short time that we've been franchising, I've actually refined the audience quite a bit, uh, a lot with your help, even in the, at the Young Conference. So, yeah. You know, originally we we're looking for sales professionals with B2B experience. And, and you know, you and I, we did a session that you were leading and, and since IT was one of the people that were up there and we said, all right, yeah. let's narrow that down. Do where right. do they work? Right. We're looking for the salespeople that work at ADP, because if you can sell ADP, you can sell my right. services. Right. right. Um, and even so, we've, you know, even after that conference, we've narrowed down our audience even more i'll give you an example we've we've talked to some people that used to sell uh let's say uh solar for example they yeah they great sure. solar now what are they doing they're knocking on residential doors for the most part we don't uh -huh. work with residential people we work with businesses b2b also the sales cycle that they're used to the sales pace that they're used to is much longer it's a longer sales cycle right? yeah right they're, they're knocking on doors or it's a 30 you know a 90 day decision there's multiple people involved you're sending off one quote where our customers our sales people our franchisees which are most commonly having that sales role they're going 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 they're networking once they bring aboard a customer they're sending off quotes for three laptops today and two desktops tomorrow right. even the type of sales you're doing doesn't align with our type of sales so we're even trying to look at the type of work they've done and does it align well and does it have a good crossover with ours so i agree with that 100 percent. yeah and that's i think i think that's that's uh that's what works in this industry and um and there's sort of this lost art of of building an audience that you're one not only it, so it's an audience that uh, if if they do invest in your franchise, because that's what they're doing, right? They're they're an investor and they have all these ways to make business. They could just they could just save the money. They could open a restaurant. Uh, they could do multi level. They could do like an all state insurance agency. They could uh, start a business from their garage. Like it's just so many ways to start businesses. And if you're lucky enough to be the system, the model that that entrepreneur chooses of their own free will, and for most of us, our, our franchise fee is 48,000, right? So you're, it's a huge amount of money that somebody's investing into your system. And so if you work that backwards, if, if that's the case, then I think we just, we have the responsibility to try our best to, to award the franchise to the best entrepreneur, because by the way, even the entrepreneur that is like a hundred percent a fit could fail. Like think about that. The absolute best fit for your franchise could still fail. 
because it's business, right? I mean, Absolutely. Uh, the the numbers of of I, I don't know what it is. Like you know, eighty percent of businesses fail after five years, whatever it is, right? I mean, it's crazy numbers. And so so we owe it to those entrepreneurs to to empower them with the right model and make sure we empower the the right people. Yeah, absolutely. So if we're new if we're new to franchising, we're an emerging franchise, the first thing we should be looking at is who is our audience. And and if we yeah. we've done the work, we've narrowed it down, we know who our audience is. What is the goal of that marketing plan? How, you know, what do you usually recommend as the best way to reach out to them? And what should your goal be? Is your goal typically, uh, you know, I see some people trying to go for that sale right away versus just build a relationship or uh, allow them to gather some information. What do you guys see it working as far as um, outreach? When you're finally getting a hold of them, what does that message look like when you know who the right audience is? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think... When you think about an audience, um, every every audience has a shared pain point. So uh, if you look at um, so you look at nonviolent revolutions, right? So uh, the the Ukraine went through this, which is it's actually a beautiful case study about nonviolent revolutions. There's these students that are just like we're so sick of the dictatorship uh, that's been in Ukraine. We're sick. I think I don't think it was a dictatorship, but it was it was corrupt. It was bad. So these students who have no money, um, powerless, right, and probably afraid of their lives, like if they were caught trying to build a revolution, they'd just be killed, right? So this is this is an audience, and, and what they do is they know exactly what the pain point is of the people they're trying to activate. And here's what they have to do. In order for them to create a revolution, they, they're, they're not just recruiting like five people. They've got to recruit millions of people to take action. And again, they have no money and no power and they might get killed, right? So that's that sucks. <laughs> so so you, you look at that case study and what's interesting about about it was the uh, the the uh, is it pink revolution or purple? I can't remember what they call the orange, orange. So they use the color orange, right? So they add a color and then they go and they say, okay, what is our pain, right? The shared pain that all of us have here in Ukraine is is we're sick of corruption. We're sick of of the vote being um, uh, uh, rigged, right? We're, we're sick of, of not having a voice. And they, and they had very specifically what that pain point is. And these students just would go to the university and go to these computers where they couldn't be tracked and they just start creating content, right? And every time they're creating content, talking about the pain point and, and, and they hit it and they hit it and they hit it. And, 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 and the pain point makes the audience, like all these people, millions and millions, it starts with just 50 and a hundred and a thousand. And then 10,000, right? It just goes viral. And those pain points get these people to basically opt in, right? And say, yeah, I'm sick of this too. Like that, that, I, I have that pain. And then they serve them with, well, what if I told you that there was a way that if all of us take action, that we could topple that dictator, that we could topple the, the regime that's there. And, and if, so, so number one, you go after the, the pain of the audience, which is a shared pain that they all have. Number two, you say, what if, what if, if what could happen? And the reality is, is that this, we could do it. And then the third thing they do is they say, imagine what life will be once a dictator is gone. Uh, imagine the fact that your vote would count. Imagine the fact that you have a voice, um, that inflation won't be as crazy as it is, that corruption and violence will go down. And so it's painting like this brand new vehicle for people. And that's how they get millions of people to take action. So, okay, so what does it have to do with franchising and business? Here's what it has to do. You're doing the same thing because as a franchisor, you don't have, unless you're, I don't know, I don't know what company you could be, but listen, Amada and Cinch, I can, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, uh, Rick, you don't have millions of dollars to spend. No, on definitely not. Market, right? <laughs> So most companies that are trying to go after an audience have limited funds. So the only way you're going to be able to effectively do that with the money you have, like talking dollars and cents. I know we went very, um, uh, very, you know, like revolution speaking, but let's not go back to, to practical. You have a limited amount of money. So what you, what you have to do is you have to know the pain point of that audience and you have to put that pain point in front of them. And a lot of people say that that's unethical for you to leverage pain. I don't think so. Do you? So do you, for example, think that it's unethical that um, that a revolutionary is doing that in Ukraine to topple dictatorship? Do you think that it's it's unethical for Apple to create a 
an ad that says I'm a I'm a PC, I'm Apple, right? And <laughs> and those commercials were were basically revolution. Yeah. It was basically that they were they toppled the dictator. Like you look at what Apple did, and we don't we don't see that as unethical. We see that as they they put a pain point in front of us that we didn't even know we had. It's like I always used the PC, and I saw the commercials. Like you're right. I hate using a PC, right? <laughs> like, you're right. I didn't know that. So all of a sudden, we, we put that pain point in front of us. We're like, holy crap, I do. I feel that pain point if it's latent or, or, or on our sleeve, right? So and then, and then all they said is they said, you know what? I know you have this pain, and um, I might have a solution for you. You don't have to buy an mm -hmm. Apple. You don't have to become a Century IT franchisee. You don't have to become an Amada franchisee. But I have a, 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 a hunch that based on your pain point, based on who you are, that we could be a great solution for you. Um, you know, so, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you, you know, what that what it sounds like you're really talking about here is actually, I don't know if you've ever done any studies or reading on, you know, storytelling. That's what you're talking about. It's storytelling. It's yeah. developing your, not only your brand story, but the story that resonates with your customer. It's a compelling story. You know, let's tell you a story about the struggle that you might be going through, and let me do a, let me let me do something here and introduce the hero to you. And that hero is not hey, a, not I, necessarily I, us, right? Sometimes it even can be them. That hero that took the chance, that took the leap of faith, that yeah. you know believed in themselves enough to go and take the steps towards entrepreneurship. And then let's show you what the better world looks like, right? That's storytelling. That's scripting. That's Hollywood right there as well. You know, on a more dramatic, you know, that's a more dramatic scale. But that's exactly what you're talking about in that revolution story and in this is how do you tell a story that resonates with your potential awardee? That's what it sounds like. Yeah, that's exactly it. And and the thing about the story and the hero and um, and and telling of it is that unless unless, you know, your audience really, really well, then it, it comes off as either patronizing or unauthentic, right? So gosh, back to the Apple commercial, um, you, you you just go look at those commercials again. You see how well um, the, the storytellers knew PC users. I mean, they were talking about things that we didn't really used to talk about in commercials before, which was my computer freezes all the time and I get viruses. Mm -hmm. Like that is a very, very unbelievably specific problem that millions of PC users have, right? So, um, and, and then, and then they went and told that story. So for us, what we realized with Amada Senior Care is that, uh, there's an audience out there, which was, for example, the, the pharmaceutical rep. And I, I mentioned earlier in this call that, uh, our first franchise partner was Robert Christensen who spent 13 years at Pfizer pharmaceuticals. And, and I said, down with Rob, I was like, Rob, like, why did you take such a crazy risk? Like I would not have taken that risk. You were the first franchisee of Amada Senior Care. We had no proof that this would work. There was no, you're like you're you're the craziest early adopter. Why? <laughs> and what's funny is 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 Rob went through a lot of things with us, but he started talking about his pain points, which were so specific. He's like, listen, healthcare is changing so much. I used to make great money as a pharmaceutical rep. Now, because of regulation, I can only make so much, and I'm limited to what I can say, what I can do. Um, I'm not having as much fun anymore. I'm I'm worried about uh, re all these regulations that are coming uh, on on the pharmaceutical industry. Oh, I have some some feedback there. Sorry, that's, that's actually right. on my side. There you go. Right. I think you got it. There you go. So 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 Rob, right? So he had all these very specific pain points that that he talked to us about, and um, and so when we heard that, we're like, wow. So Rob, and it was it's so funny thinking back to that, going, well, so Rob, do, do other pharmaceutical reps feel the way you do? And he's like, oh yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, talk, <laughs> I'm talking about Pfizer pharmaceuticals. Yeah. I mean, these guys, we're all going, what the heck's going to happen? We're all, we're going to get fired. There's layoffs happening. And so, and so we knew specifically what was going on with that specific audience. So then I can tell a story, right? I can then, I can then go to that audience broadly and say, Hey, listen, a pharmaceutical rep at Abbott, pharmaceutical rep at um, or, or medical device rep at Medtronic. Are you also feeling X, Y, Z pain points? Well, yep. Yeah, I am. Oh, well, cool. So, um, and that's when we talked about if, if all you know about your audience is they're executives. <sighs> Good luck trying to tell them a story. <laughs> how, do you, how do you tell that story? Now, you could broadly say, are you tired of corporate America? Sure. Are you tired of corporate politics? 
um, glass ceiling. There are themes in a broader audience, uh, but what will happen to you, I believe, is you need to have a much larger cash fund to go after a broader audience. Um, you know, Nike goes after runners, right? That was audience number one. That was very broad. But if you go back to the beginning of Nike, they went after uh, their first shoe was really for um, uh, track. Track. It, it was running. It wasn't basketball. They didn't have a shoe for that. So when they started with limited funds, they couldn't take the whole entire industry. They didn't have the pain points of the entire, but they had the pain point of the runner. Yep. They knew what it felt to, to run on gravel, to run on pavement, to run on sidewalks. And they could solve that pain point and tell that story. So you, you have to, have to, have to know that audience intimately or else you're going to spend a fortune trying to find them yeah, or absolutely. trying to motivate them. So if we identify our audience and we understand what their pain points are, right? You, in Miami, you talked about LinkedIn in mail is a, is a great way to be able to deliver that message to them. Yeah. Um, you're still thinking that LinkedIn in mail is, is the best way? It's a good resource? Or does it really depend on who your audience is? Like, you know, LinkedIn is a great place to maybe find sales professionals for someone like myself. But Facebook might be a better platform for certain brands. Is it... Is the method of delivering that message typically different based on who that audience is? Yeah, yeah, I think it's different based on who the audience is. Um, so, so if you have a product that is ideal for um, people who really like uh, BMWs, well, you're you're not going to be able to identify those people on LinkedIn because LinkedIn doesn't keep track of our likes. Yeah. LinkedIn keeps track of our careers, our jobs, our uh, say, our uh, job titles, companies we've worked for. Our, you know, like it, it, we also have the things people have rated us. We're good at sales. We're good at ops. We're good at Six Sigma. We're, you know, right? It has yep, that. Yep. But nowhere on LinkedIn is it going to say that I am a fan of BMW. So if you have a product that you want to sell to people that are BMW fans, which I could find, you know, all kinds of products that might fit for that. LinkedIn may not be it. So I'm I'm completely agnostic. I, I do not care about I'm it's not like I'm a, a LinkedIn fanboy or I love Facebook. I, I don't care. What I care is is once I know my audience, where are they and can I find them? Yep. So you look at the pharmaceutical rep or the medical device uh, rep, um, just that that title alone, I know I can go to LinkedIn and say, show me all Show me all medical device reps that work for Medtronic who are on LinkedIn. That's a that's a number. Like LinkedIn is going to spit oh, back yeah. a number, which is so cool. They don't even spit back like I think it's like approximately a million. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like it's a number, like 5,000, 10,000, 2,000. So it's really cool that you can then gauge, you know, what are you going to say to that specific audience? So that's why I love uh, LinkedIn for that. Um, but, but it goes back to, you just got to find who the audience is and then determine, are they on platform X, Y, and Z? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So now doing this since 2012, how about more traditional stuff like Google AdWords and things like that? Do you guys stay away from it? You think it's a waste of money? Do you think you can still deliver a good message to the right audience or do you shy away from it? We have it. You know, it's kind of funny. We've been talking a lot about that, about the diversification, right? So 120 locations now and, and do we diversify? And and we we do kind of like these tests where we do like a Google pay-per-click or we'll do like a different audience. We went after we've gone after financial planners. We've gone after uh, um, guys that are uh, that's we went after a group that was people who sell carpets for Shaw carpet because they're going to. <laughs> yeah, because like there's a whole audience. There's all these like territory sales guys that go into hotels and hospitals and sell like like millions of dollars in carpet. Right. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. It failed miserably. They wanted nothing to do with us. I couldn't really reach them. I didn't really understand their pain points. And it was kind of, you know, it didn't really fit. Sure. So, so, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of interesting. Like we, we have just stuck with what we know. We know the audience so well, we know that when they acquire our franchise, our system, that they, that they can be successful and we haven't found a diminishing return and in, in, in attracting that audience. And so, it's still our audience. And, and keep in mind of this is, is so 
if my audience is somebody who sells medical devices, if I go on a Google pay-per-click campaign, what they are usually maybe looking at is maybe they'll they'll uh, they'll do like you know medical device jobs. Yep. So yep. that could that could be good, right? Um, but but Google is so much about what I am searching for, not who I am. Correct. Yeah. So uh, even even those pay per click campaigns for like medical device jobs, we've kind of stayed away from because that can also be folks that are just getting out of college trying to get into that industry, yep. um, which is not potentially who I'm, I'm looking for somebody that has 30 years of experience, right? Yeah. Or 20 years of experience. So uh, long story short, no, we, <laughs> we stick with LinkedIn. Yep. Well, which is great. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we've seen the kind of the same thing on the Google, you know, anytime we've tried to purchase, you know, PPC or anything like that, it's, we, we feel like we end up wasting a lot of money. We're not getting, a, we're not able to target appropriately. Um, it's, that's, you know, throwing darts at a board. So, um, now how about, how about the organic stuff? Do you guys see a lot of stuff coming in organically through your website or social yeah. media? Yeah. So uh, that's actually been interesting. The last, last year, uh, we awarded a good amount of franchises from people who just saw us because what's happening is we're getting recognized by entrepreneur magazine. We're getting recognized by uh, Forbes. Uh, and there's a lot of content about how senior care is explosive and all that. So we're getting, and actually, the folks that are coming in that are finding us uh, have been really cool. They're they're not medical device pharmaceutical folks, but some of them have very relevant experience. So uh, this year, we're we're um, I, I should say we're gearing up. We haven't really done anything about it. We're trying to figure out how do we increase that organic side, uh, but we're not very good at it. Sure, like it's really interesting. You know, we're just not we're not very good at the at the. SEO side and, and how to increase our organic. It just has happened out of exposure that we've been lucky to get. Uh, but yeah, that's been a conversation piece that we're thinking about um, uh, going after more. Gotcha. So I got two more for you and then I'm gonna let you go because I know you're a busy man. I appreciate you rescheduling yeah. for us uh, here as well. So yeah, yeah, um, I appreciate this, man. This is awesome. So here's my next question for you that I think you know most of our viewers are. Gonna, I, I, what I'm trying to do is I try to ask a lot of questions. One that I might be interested in because if I'm interested, yeah. hopefully our viewers are as well because they're yeah. most likely in the same seat as me. So right. um, talking about what works, what doesn't work, things like that. Uh, we've talked about social media, um, going after the right target works really well for you. PPC doesn't work for you. But let me ask you a question on the PPC. Yeah. Have you guys ever thought about um, going after your competitor keywords? So, for example, I know exactly who my competitor franchise is. Have, have you guys ever tried that? Have you got any good luck with it? Have it kind of been a waste? Uh, uh, no, we've we've never we've never tried it. And I, I think it, it, it comes back to... Um, I'm not so sure that, that that search is going to provide me with the ideal audience I'm looking for. Yeah. It might provide me with people who are interested in the home care market, but that, that is so broad. So if, if I, if somebody typed in, um, a home instead franchise yeah. and if I outbid and I come up as a, as a sponsored right there and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm up there, somebody's going to click on that. When that lead comes in, I'm going to get most likely uh, first, last name, email, phone number, right? That's what we put in a form. Yep. I know zero. I know zero about that person. So, um, so if if we're so you think about in a week, if I have fifty leads that come in that week, but let's say that ten of them come from that campaign. What I've done now is I have ten people that came in through that campaign that I know zip about. All, all I know is name, first, last name, phone number, email address, and that they were searching for a home instead franchise. Yep. To me, that is not enough. And I've now taken time from my team to pre-qualify that person. Even if it's if it's 10 out of the, out of 50, percentage wise, that's a lot. So I could be filling my 50 with people that I know a whole heck of a lot more about. Because when a lead comes in from LinkedIn, I can go back on LinkedIn look at their profile, find out what companies they've worked for, what their experience is, how many years they've been there. And I, I'm already thinking what their pain points are. So my first phone call with that person is going to be way more rich than the phone call I have with Susie Smith, who was looking at a home instead that I know nothing about. Yeah. Now, that's a huge preconceived, like I've convinced myself of this. <laughs> I, I could be 100% wrong. But that's the story I'm telling myself, and and so far uh, we haven't tried it. Yeah, and it, it, that's kind of what we see as well. And that's why I asked that question: is so we've done 
we've done some of that stuff. And when we get those sales leads in, you're absolutely right. We got first name, last name, you know, maybe whatever contact form you put together that right, says, hey, right. you know, when are you looking to buy? What are you looking to invest? Those kind of things. But we have very little information about the person themselves. And yeah. so when we have that initial phone call, we're starting from scratch. Hey, tell me about yourself. <laughs> right? right. Now, when right. we send off the LinkedIn in-mail campaigns, and they're focused at ADP reps, and we gave them the pain point, and then we said, hey, if you're suffering from these, if you're dealing yeah. with these and you don't want to deal with it anymore, then contact us. Let's talk about it. When that when that lead form comes in and it tells me, hey, they actually came from the ADP link, shoot, I don't right. even need to look them up on LinkedIn. I know where they work. They work exactly. at ADP. <laughs> uh, exactly. The interesting part is we actually, so you taught me this um, in Miami, and just and just to give you an idea of how far we took it, we, t- you and I talked about creating an ad for Liberty Mutual sales yeah. professionals because my top performing franchisee also came from Liberty Mutual and actually absolutely knocked it out of the park. So right. we did that. We created the ad. We created the pain points. And what did I do to create the pain points? I went back to him and said, hey, what would you hate about Liberty Mutual? Why would you come over here? Yeah, he right. told me. We yeah. put that in the message. Yeah. And then one of the big things that you talked about, which I think is incredibly important to, to bring up, is you said, great. You captured their attention in that in-mail. If they click more or fill out the contact form or whatever, you got to carry that message through. So yeah. if they click on the Liberty Mutual one, we bring them to a landing page. And check this out. What we did based on your fee, your your recommendation, I put a picture of my top performing franchisee yeah. on the landing page. And it says, hi, my name is Jay Small. I, too, used to work at Liberty Mutual. I remember yeah. when I worked there, I couldn't stand this, this, and this. That's right. I bought a Cinch IT franchise. I'm now the top performing franchise. If you want to learn how you can be too, fill out this. And and so what I took away from your webinar, from your presentation was carry that same message through, personalize it as much as humanly possible to the point where I literally put an employee, a picture of him that said, <laughs> who used to work there and said, yeah. I've been in your shoes too. Talking about that storytelling, right? Not only do you have, are they the hero of the story? We just gave them a sidekick. Right, we just gave them a sidekick. Yeah. Hey, this guy was sidekick. this guy walked right alongside of you. That's um, right. And, and we did that. And I got to tell you, it's been very, it's been a great campaign. It's been a that's great awesome. campaign. So that's some of the best advice that we got. And and so you know, I, just, I know you do a lot of speaking. I, I follow your content on LinkedIn. I think you're well, always thanks, putting out good content. But <clears throat> you know, for someone who 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 travels and talks to to IT people. I always wonder, hey, when I gave that presentation, I gave it my all and I put together some really good, powerful stuff. Does anybody actually take it home and implement it? So I'm living proof that we do. <laughs> we do. We implement that's your good. words. <laughs> oh, man. I'm, that makes me so happy, dude. I, I think that's – and it's – it becomes so much more – so much more fun, right? Your 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 day is 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 a lot more fun. And, and part of – I think part of why we went this way with, with Amada is, is – um, I just wasn't, I just, I wasn't willing to walk in on a Monday morning and, you know, you walk in and you have, I don't know, because Mondays is when you get a lot of the leads, right? Because it's set for the weekend. Oh, absolutely. So you, you walk in on Monday and you have 40 leads. I don't know. And the prospect of me or my team or whoever sitting there and just picking up and, and calling people and, and people from all walks of life and nothing against people from all walks of life, but it, it, just, I was like, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. Like I care too much about my time. I care too much about this company. I care too much about um, the people we're trying to serve that I'm not going to call 40 random people that I know nothing about. And, and, and there's, there's also a little bit of laziness in there of like, oh, I don't want to do it, you know? But I think that was, was kind of a driving force to go how, like there's gotta be a way to make those 40 leads that come in on a Monday, like way, way better. Because other people are doing it. You you got to believe that uh, the big companies out there that we that we love are figuring out a way to make their inquiries legit. Absolutely. Right. So and if and and if if like we talked about, if these poor uh, students in Ukraine can get millions of people to activate with no money, then there's got to be a way for you to improve your leads with a little bit of money. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and it makes your life just so much more enjoyable. Yep. No, I appreciate that. And uh, Marcos, listen, I. I 
I know it's it's getting late over here, I, and and I appreciate you taking the time. I've I've taken yeah, almost man. an hour of your time already, so <laughs> um, I, I will let you go. I really appreciate you jumping on. I know that our viewers are going to love this content. Uh, I Thanks, think they're going to have a lot of questions. Uh, what we'll do is, uh, guys, we're actually going to link all of Marcos's information below with his permission. Uh, we'll yep. we'll put his information down below in case you guys have questions. Hope maybe you're interested in buying an Amato franchise. Maybe you just want <laughs> some good advice from somebody who's been there and has been doing it for a really long time i learned a lot from you marcos i appreciate that and i i hope our viewers do as well so thanks for coming on with us today i appreciate it you got it man thanks appreciate right. it thanks you mark thank you marcos all right guys that was marcos mora i hope you guys learned a ton of valuable stuff from him i gotta tell you i love marcos i think that dude is awesome uh, such a super nice guy always willing to help anybody in the franchise community really really awesome dude uh, hopefully you guys learned a lot from him. Like I said, for me, I learned so much from him in the past. I implemented a ton of stuff he talked about specifically in regards to identifying exactly who my buyer is, how creating a message custom tailored for them to talk about their pain points, carrying that message through until we get them on the phone and even continuing that conversation when we get a hold of them. Um, really learned a lot from him. Hopefully you guys did too. See you guys in the next episode. And don't forget, stay tuned for a little Iron Man update. I love the journey of a real challenge, the Iron Man. It inspires me to reimagine my own limits and to push myself further than ever before. The Iron Man is a statement of excellence, passion, and commitment. It's a test of physical toughness and mental strength. It's about enduring and persevering. Right now, I'm 30 pounds overweight. I own several businesses, I'm married with three kids, I don't swim, and I don't own a bike. But I hope to be an example of hard work and dedication for the people I know, for my family. Because my children will be watching this journey, they will see the sweat, they will witness the pain, because they will be waiting at the finish line, hopeful that daddy might accomplish this impossible goal. Good morning guys, a little Ironman update. Uh, yesterday did a half marathon, um, completed it. It didn't feel too bad. Uh, legs felt okay this morning, so I did jump on the trainer and uh, did a bike ride today. And it went okay. Uh, it actually probably helped loosen me up a bit. Question for you guys. I got professionally fitted. I've tried a couple different seats wearing a chamois, which is like a diaper for bikes. And my lower region still goes numb at a, there are about 20 minutes on a bike. What am I doing wrong? Cause that feels like that's not supposed to happen. And if I'm supposed to do a bike for five, six hours, I am afraid of what might happen. Um, hopefully when I get outside my body shifts and I'm standing up a little bit and I shift around more and more when I get off the trainer and get outside that fixes it but comment down below let me know if that is the issue or if I'm missing something appreciate it guys